Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be doing a teardown of the classic NES system by Nintendo and uh, we're going to be explaining what all the chips do inside and exactly how it works It'll be a, a noob's guide so for those who have absolutely no, no idea this will be perfect for you just to get a, a good understanding of what makes this 8-bit console tick and we are using in this video we are using as you can see, a UK NES made in 1990, no, 1985, sorry, I nearly said 95 then, 1985, but this will also be valid for the NTSC NES as well, because they're both the same, uh, the front loader, obviously not the top loader, um, and the Famicom is also different as well, but if you'd like to see a teardown of that and an explanation of all the chips inside, then I can do that too. But here is the NES, and I took out all the screws and everything inside, and we'll do a quick rundown of everything till we get to the, the motherboard and the chips, just so that you know what everything is. So we'll start off now with this just metal sheet here, you know, unscrew straight off, and basically what that is is just a static shield, um, stops all the static noise and stuff from interference, doesn't really make any difference in today's um, age with the technology about today. But with all the RF signals and things like that, and just uh, build up a static, this sort of discharged any interference. And it was also used as a kind of a heat sink as well, just to draw uh, heat out the console. Next up, we've got this interface here, which is the cartridge mechanism, which just puts your cartridge down. And it is literally just some simple bit of uh, plastic here, which is just a clip. As you can see, the clip there. And it just holds the cartridge down. And the reason why it does that is because here on the cartridge connector, if I turn it up, the cartridge goes in here. And the way it's connected, it wouldn't actually make a solid connection to the console unless you clicked it down. And then the cartridge would uh, sandwich together on both sides and make a clear connection. So now we're actually down to the motherboard, we can't actually see any chips at the moment. That's because they're all on the underside. So I've already undone that, so we'll take this out. And what we'll do is we'll flip it over and you'll see we've got some more shield in there. And we've got all our connectors and stuff here, so I'll undo this. Let's slide this stuck down there. doesn't want to come apart there because I should have undone these first so let's undo these cables and that should come straight off there we go so that's just once again just a, a bit more shielding and then obviously as you see we've just pulled out some connectors here which go to the pad sockets and then this one here is for all your power buttons and your reset button and they go straight onto the board this section here is a power supply and what it does is it feeds in um, 12 volt and uh, places 5 volt it down downgrades it to 5 volt into the steps it down to 5 volt into the board sorry and um, you can actually power an NES directly from 5 volt and I will be doing videos showing you how to do that and I'll be doing a few showing you how to make a portable NES as well using a lithium battery so please leave comments down below if you'd like me to hurry up and make those but moving on we've got the cartridge connector here is actually just connected straight to the board because it flips the cartridge around like that and then it's uh, I suppose it was space saving then they could have it on and all the chips are hidden away then rather than trying to build something across here and taking up this space so now we have the board out on its own we'll get this presented a bit nice nicer and then I'll go through what all these chips mean and what all they do 
Right, so we're going to start off with this chip here, which is the main processor or the CPU, which is essentially the brains of the unit, and it's what controls everything and tells everything what to do. And this is the RP2A07 chip, which was made by Ricoh, and it runs at 1.79 megahertz uh, clock rate, and runs off the MOS6502 chipset technology, which this had a few differences made, a few modifications by Nintendo. Um, which made it include a sound chip in it as well which allowed Nintendo to copyright the design and stop people from making clones of the system or at least make it harder to make clones for the system uh, if you have an NTSC uh, NES you'll notice that this is the 2A03 instead of the 7 and the difference is that there was um, uh, a few modifications made to um, handle the difference between 50Hz PAL uh, and 60Hz NTSC refresh rates and things like that. There are a couple of other little differences as well. Um, but other than that, that's that's that main chip, the main CPU. Next off, we'll move up onto this chip, which is the RPTC07, and this is essentially the PPU or the picture processing unit, and this is responsible for handling all the graphical data um, that gets passed to it from the cartridge and then moves it into memory and onto the screen. And once again, if you have an NTSC model, uh, this will be labeled the RPTC-02 instead of the 07. Next up, we're going to move down onto these two chips here, which you'll notice are slightly different. One's quite thin and one's quite thick, but they are pretty much the same chip. Yeah, 16 kilobits of uh, RAM. And basically this one here is for the video RAM and what this does is stores all the video data in order to pass it to the screen in order to make a seamless motion. Um, for example, if you take old Atari games, uh, back in the old days you'd get to the end of a screen on a platformer and then it would scroll across and then the new screen would load. Well that saves it doing that basically. It's in Mario when you move in and it's scrolling in a nice seamless motion. That's what this does. It saves a bit of extra memory in and loads it onto the screen before it's actually displayed so that it can keep it running in a nice smooth uh, seamless motion and this one over here is the um, WRAM which is for all the processes and just makes everything load faster and keeps it in time just controls uh, everything what's going on in the, the sort of like the code level if you say this one does video and that one does everything else and you'll notice that in different models of the NES console you might get two of these chips in or two of these small chips one one over here as well and it's perfectly normal it's just uh, whatever chips they could get at the time I suppose and they would just put them in they're just pretty much identical chips even though they're by different companies this one over here is by Rico and this one over here is by Hyundai but they're pretty much just the same thing. Okay, so moving on to this chip here. This is a Texas Instruments a generic logic chip, which basically just helps move uh, data to the PPU chip, just to help everything move more efficiently. And then if you look at this chip over here, and this chip over here, we have the uh, hex inverter and the decoder and demultiplexer which are basically just, just normal uh, standard logic chips which just help everything work and the same with these here uh, which are the hex bus buffers and they're all just off the shelf normal chips that you find in, in a lot of uh, electronics similar to this And then finally, we move on to this little chip down here, which is the 3197A, and this is actually Nintendo's uh, lockout chip, or NES 10 chip, or 10 NES chip. And uh, basically this is the device that uh, Nintendo designed that stopped people from creating unlicensed cartridges for the system. And what it does essentially uh, contains like a rainbow table 
which is literally built up of uh, like Mario heads and flower pots and things like that. And what it does is it talks to a similar chip in the cartridge and it sort of uh, talks to it via sort of code and confirms whether it's an actual official cartridge or not. And if it's not, or if it's from a different region, it will lock it out and just give you a flashing screen. Um, there are ways past it, quite a few ways, and I will do some videos showing you the different ways to get past that. And I might actually do a video of exactly how this works because it is quite fascinating. And uh, it's really complex and, and really clever how Nintendo designed it, to be honest. But yeah, that, that um, pretty much sums up all the chips on the NES motherboard. The only thing left is this thing here, which is the expansion port, which was never actually used on the console. You'll see on the bottom of the case, there is a socket, but when you take the socket off, there is also that still fixed in. So originally this was designed with the idea of being used for something, but then they decided not to use it. Now what it does is it connects, one thing that we do know is that it connects the extra audio, which in a Famicom co uh, game, you would have sometimes extra audio channels and they would pass through uh, and come out of the system and also the microphone support, which was in controller two on the Famicom but you can actually access all that from, from this socket, but it was never actually used. There is somebody out there, I can't think of the name of him name. Uh, I'll try and get it uh, on the bottom of the screen, but he does do a device what fits in the bottom and lets you pull the extra audio out of it. Um, I think it's about £15 for the, for the uh, little board. It slots in all nicely and stops you from needing to uh, solder or modify anything else. Um, but other than that really it's not really used and it's just more of a, a novelty thing I'd say it's just uh, something you can do and I will actually do a video showing you how to make your own um, well or at least how to modify and solder it I won't go full blown and do a board that I fit in there but I will show you what pins to pull out um, to solder off in order to get the extra audio and stuff the one thing you will notice is here the it says NES CPU 11 and that is the revision number of the board and 11 is actually the highest one they went to and the differences won't really be any difference on the actual board might be a lot with the memory differences but the main difference for the revisions were the lockout chip and the fact of they had to keep updating it in order to stop people from um, making unlicensed cartridges and by 11, uh, as you say, this was on the bottom of the case, it said 1985, but this board has actually got 1987 on it. But it's not 100% if this was manufactured later than that. So it's at least as early as 1987, but it would suggest that that's quite a few board revisions by that time. But then by that time, they got it solid, and you'll find that a lot of unlicensed cartridges won't run on this system. So if you get a game and it's said to work and it's unlicensed and you put it in your NES and it doesn't work, it might not actually be faulty. It might be a case of that your board revision is too high and it's locking it out. Now the earliest board revision is a, a 04. That's the earliest one. And ideally if you want to be playing licensed carts, unlicensed carts and things like that, like the um, Tengen games and things like that, then... Uh, you'd want to try and get as low as possible, and a 04 is the lowest one you can get. But yeah, that pretty much wraps up um, everything that I can go into. All these little bits here, there's no point going into them, they're just all transistors and, and capacitors and things like that, and general electronic things. And as I said, in here is your RF unit uh, and your uh, power supply unit and your... Um, composite outputs there there's no point going into that um, but yeah if you have any questions or if I've missed anything and you've realised let me know and I'll try and get updates done or whatever but uh, thanks for watching and hopefully this educated a few people in a simple way of how a NES actually works thanks for watching, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next video, take care